City Council and the Minnehaha County Commissioners. <coughs> First item will be roll call. Uh, that will be. County recognizes there's there. County recognizes. County recognizes there's a chairman, or there's a quorum here, Commissioner Barth, Commissioner Peckus, and Commissioner Kelly. Uh, Council members Anderson. Here. Erickson. Here. Erpenbach. Here. Jameson. Here. Karski. Kylie. Here. Rolfing. Yes. Staggers. Present. Yes. Now I'd like to lead the uh, Pledge of Allegiance, please. Get all stand. to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> Have the Minnehaha County Commissioners take action to approve the regular agenda? Motion to approve the agenda. I have a motion and a second from the county. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. Motion from the City Council. Move to approve. Kyle. Lincoln, Rolf. Roll call, please. Council Members Anderson. Yes. Erickson. Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. The regular agenda has been approved, and the next item will be resolu oh, excuse me. Item one is a resolution advising and giving consent to the appointment of members to the Homeless Advisory Board. Good evening, commissioners and counselors. Thank you for your time. I'm Stacy Teason. I'm the coordinator for the Homeless Advisory Board, and I'm here to ask you to approve a new person for our board. Joan Franken is replacing Doug Morrison, whose term expired on the board. Joan has been with Costello Companies for over 19 years. She's an expert on affordable housing and tax credits, and she expressed a huge interest in joining the board and working on homeless issues in this community. So I personally am very excited to add her to the board, and I ask that you make a motion to approve. Thank you. Are there any questions on the county side for Stacy? Commissioner Barth. I'm just going to make a motion to approve uh, her appointment. Okay, is there a motion, from, a motion and a second from the county side to approve Joan Franken to the Homeless Advisory Board. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. Same motion on the city side. Second, Erickson. Roll call. Council members Anderson? Yes. Erickson? Erpenbach? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. And that passes. Next item. Thank you. Next item two is the joint budget hearing for Sioux Land Libraries. Good afternoon. Mary Johns, Library Director. And I want to thank you for the opportunity to share our budget request with you this year. Um, I would also like to thank the Library Board for their support and advocacy. And as most of you know, we have representatives from both the City of Sioux Falls and the County um, on the Siouxland Library's Board. Um, Commissioner um, Barth is the representative um, from the County Commission. And we also have um, eight libraries in the county that we serve, as well as the five locations in the city. We have branches in and I'm going to read these this time because I never remember all eight. Um, but we have um, branches in Brandon, Valley Springs, Gerritsen, Baltic, Crooks, Colton, Humboldt, and Hartford on the county side, and then five locations um, in the city, including the Downtown Library, Cayley Branch, Running Branch, Oakview, and Prairie West Branch. Um, we also wouldn't be here if it weren't for um, the quality staff that we have, so I thank them for all the work they do in terms of providing the service, and Jody Fick, the Assistant Library Director, and Ann Bowden from Finance for helping put this budget together. Um, our basic intent and service remains constant. We're really here to help people discover and learn for life. 
We have worked on expanding our access to library services both through technology and additional programming that we've been able to offer for a variety of reasons. We strive to deliver current and relevant materials. After all, customers want what's the most current and the most relevant in their lives, and that helps us make a difference in their lives. We also want to provide fast and efficient service, and certainly we have been able to do that as a result of, of budget requests um, in the past where we were able to implement some technology that has made a significant difference for us. We continue to promote reading, learning, and discovery. In spite of what everyone hears about all of the digital world, the library is truly about reading and learning. So it matters not to us what the format is. Um, we are here to help people achieve those goals. And we also have put a renewed emphasis on early childhood literacy. That's our future. That's your future. That's our community's future. So we are, are investing a great deal of effort in, in promoting the early childhood literacy components. In our $7.8 million budget for 2015, please note that $1,012,000 of that comes from the Minnehaha County Library tax. And I would like to, to make sure that I mention this time, thank you for reminding me last time, Councillor Anderson, that um, in Colton this past year, the community came together in a way that is truly beyond belief. Um, they were, in, in terms of the arrangement with the county, the individual communities provide the facilities for library service. And so the library in Colton had been in, in a rental property for a number of years, and there were certainly reasons that, that we needed to do something different. And so the community got together, and the elevator built a new building, and so they had a, basically it was like a double wide uh, modular structure, which they gave to the city for a library. And it was placed on, on a new lot across from the old library. And then they gathered all kinds of donations and in-kind contributions. Contractors did service for nothing. It was, an ex it was just a stellar kind of effort on, on their part. And the building is stunning, as Councillor Anderson knows. We attended the, the grand opening. So anytime you have an opportunity or are in Colton, um, it certainly would be worth your while to, to be able to stop by, by the library and see what that community um, did. And I think that also speaks to the fact that the services that we provide are truly appreciated in, in the community. Um, in terms of capital program, our biggest capital expenditure is our collection. And this includes the materials that, that you see on the screen as well as, as some additional items. Uh, we have about 340,000 items in our collection right now, and we will be able to add approximately um, 38,000 more items during the next year with, with the budget that we have. Um, and we also are continuing to look at the digital resources. Hoopla is a new service that we provide this year, um, which is streaming uh, movie, TV shows, and, and um, music. So we are constantly responding to what's going on in the world of technology. Um, our operating budget, as with everyone else's budget, um, personnel is, is our big issue, asset. Um, so we certainly want to invest in, in that piece. You will notice that our personnel budget is down slightly this year um, because we did experience a number of, of retirements in 2014. Um, this also includes $1.7 million for operating, which helps us provide um, programming and, and technology and day-to-day and -day operations for this investment in our community. And as I mentioned, the wages and benefits are down a bit because of, of these retirements. We have added additional funds for security at the downtown library so that we now have security every day that we're open for longer periods of time. We used to have security um, come in in the afternoon till close, and we found that the benefit of having security there all the time has been very, very positive for us. So we appreciate the opportunity to continue that piece. Um, we also have um, a significant expenditure in repair and maintenance, and, and part of this is the maintenance on the 3M equipment that we purchased with special funding for the automated materials handling system and the, the self-checks. And so we certainly want to keep those in tip-top shape because we get continued response on those from, from our customers. And then we will have some building repairs that include um, flooring and tech pointing in, in the next year. And then our supplies and materials um, will also include, for next year, a new integrated library system. This is, is the computer software that provides our catalog and the checkout system and maintains our database. We're currently working 
truthfully, on a legacy um, system, and it's definitely time um, for it to be replaced. Um, the new service will be cloud-based, so it won't require servers, which will also make it a, a more effective and efficient process moving forward. In terms of the current and relevant materials that, that we provide, I would like to share a comment from a customer, not this particular lady, but it was a lady who responded, made a comment in our survey that the library is like a candy store to her. And I think that's true of, of people of, of all ages. And part of that is because we have um, a, a wide selection of resources and formats for people to make selections. Um, and this is one of the ways that we continue to meet their needs. We talked about fast and efficient service for a number of times, and, and I referred to RFID and AMH. We, last year, um, were able to insert RFID tags in every item and e install new equipment for checkout. In addition to that, we also installed equipment that is autom called automated materials handling, so that when you return an item to the, to the um, induction units inside the library, or we empty the drop, we put them through the same system on the back side, but it checks the item in, resensitizes it, and sorts it so that it's ready to shelve. We're handling this many fewer times. And you'll see how this works um, on the screen now. This is a gentleman returning items to the, to the system. And as he puts each of those items in, it checks it in, resensitizes it, he has the option for a receipt. On the back side, it immediately the conveyor and is read and dumped into a bin that has been pre-programmed, and we have ways to set these bins up. We have 11 bin sorters downtown and five bin sorters at the, the um, city branches. So this has made a significant difference in, in how we deliver service. We also told you that we were going to do a survey, which we did. And again, this was really very positive for us. You know, that's a pretty high satisfaction rate. We're pretty proud of that. And this, again, is due to, to staff that we have that, that really provide excellent services. And a couple of comments from that customer satisfaction survey. We are frequent friends to the libraries in Sioux Falls for several of our family's needs with the internet connection because we can't afford one at home, along with getting information for events and jobs and for entertainment with books, videos, and programs. Long live libraries. And another comment from a family that said, our family could not live for one week without the library and their amazing staff. I like that. So we continue to offer programs and resources that promote learning, reading, and discovery for all ages. And whether that be in a classroom environment, such as the computer classes that we offer, or interactive classes using digital devices to, to make sure that people have the ability to use the, the digital resources that we have, or book clubs where people come together and discuss the literature, or early childhood education kinds of, of components where we are dealing with both kids and parents to help parents be that best first teacher for kids. We also have renewed um, a considerable amount of emphasis on teen services because teens are kind of a hard nut to crack sometimes. But we have some staff that are doing a great job working with teens. And, and the, the picture on this particular slide is from an event that was held at the Washington High School. We do a lot of partnerships with the schools. And this summer, at the end of summer reading program, we did a teen lock-in at all of the, the branches in, in Sioux Falls and at Brandon. And this is, is a picture of the kids at Washington High School. We actually held that one at Washington High School because they stayed all night. The rest of them were locked until 9 o'clock. So, um, the, the staff at Washington High School were apparently a little braver than, than all of the rest of us. But um, it was a very positive event and good responses from the teens. And it, and it really did talk about books and reading and library stuff. So it wasn't just you know eating pizza. Um, another piece that has been very important to us over the years is the Reading Bridge program, which is a summer tutoring program. And we've been doing this for about 14 years. And, and quite honestly, it's been done pretty much on a, on a shoestring and at three locations. We received a significant donation this past year, so we were able to extend that program to eight locations, including Brandon and T. And this was, was a donation from a, um, an individual who specifically also added that we wanted, he wanted to be able to extend this beyond just the Sioux Falls or Minnehaha County area. And people are you know, lined up waiting to get in, into this program. And this year, um, we had over 400 kids um, in this program, so it's, it's amazing. 
Another thing that we've done for the third year in a row now is um, a book walk, which we do um, from Falls Park down to the, to the, um, on the Greenway, you know, where we do concerts. <laughs> um, and, and we've done this for the third time. The first year we had about 150, and this year again we had over 400. And the governor's wife discovered this program and asked if we could share our resources. So we have now, for the second year, sent her um, copies of, of the book that we do on, along the pathway, and they do this at the governor's mansion as well. So um, we're pretty proud of that. So in summation, of course, you know that I believe that the value of libraries is pretty significant and that, that truthfully, um, we appreciate every dollar that we get from both of these bodies. And I would also like to, to suggest that you're getting a pretty good bang um, for your buck. Um, if, we, if people had to purchase the items that are checked out, they would spend over $44 million, and we know that's not going to happen. So um, we're very proud of that. And rather than asking you if you have questions, well, that is a question, what do you geek? What, you, what do you geek is a program that we're doing right now. It's a, a promotional event that, that is um, currently going on and will last for nine months. And this is where we are selecting in or, or trying to get input from our customers about what do you geek. And it's so we can build programs around this. We have posters all over. We've done programs um, around this topic. And so, for example, somebody geeks genealogy. We can share with them the genealogy resources that we have. Somebody geeks gardening. We have a program on gardening and share the materials that we have. So what do you geek? Thank you very much. Thank you. This is the time where if there's any comments from the public, we would take them on this issue. OK. Any questions on the county side for Mary Johns? Seeing no questions, is there a motion on the county side to approve the budget? Move for approval, Kelly. Second. I have a motion and a second on the county side to approve the library budget. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. It's from City Council. Councilman Staggers. Uh, yes, Mary. I was just curious about the uh, library board. How many members are there on the board, and what is their composition? In other words, those making up the county, those making up the city, and there are four appointed by the city, okay. appointed by the mayor and approved by council, and then there's one appointed by the county commission, in addition to the county commissioner who serves on on the board, and then the library director. And um, Commissioner Barth and I are ex officio members, so we don't vote. Okay, so there are. Are there seven voting members? Five. Five. Oh, okay. Okay. Any other questions from the council? Any motions? Move approval, Rolfing. Oh, oh, excuse me. I just. Councilman Kiley. It was more of a, a comment than anything. Mary, number one, I've told you before, I truly appreciate your enthusiasm. Thank you. And I appreciate what you and, and your staff do for the citizens of Sioux Falls and our counties. Uh, as a teacher of 33 years, I fully value um, and know the value of reading and reading comprehension, especially starting at an early yeah. early age. So there, again, I appreciate. And with Councillor Rolfing's approval, I would, I would move for approval. You're going to second my motion? Uh, I'll second his motion. Especially somebody. Why don't you make it again? <laughs> I move approval of the budget, library budget. And I second that. Thank you. Roll call. Council members Anderson? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. Thank you. Next item. Item three is a joint budget hearing for Metro Communications. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Why Ken's getting that set up. Uh, I'm Darren Ketchum. I'm the director of Metro Communications. Uh, with me today, I have Jennifer Disberg, our deputy director, and Anna Raker, our business manager. So uh, they're the ones that really keep this going every day and, and make sure that we stay within the, uh, the fiscal uh, limits that you set and make sure that the operations are handled uh, efficiently and effectively. Thanks. Can I jump to the other
Um, so you have our budget up in front of you there. I'm just going to flip a few slides forward. All right, so our budget is um, over last year, our revenue we're projecting to grow approximately 1%. Our, uh, do, you, do you have the actual presentation? I wouldn't be complete without a PowerPoint. Well, you're correct. I wouldn't. <laughs> I wouldn't want to get away without that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, here's a brief overview of what uh, what we're looking at today. Next slide, please. I just wanted to share a few of the. Um, things that we captured in our strategic planning process with you. I'm not going to talk in great depth about these items, but wanted you to make sure that you have those at uh, your disposal to, uh, if you have any questions at any time today or other, other times, that, uh, that you do feel free to ask us. Uh, going forward, you can see, again, some of the values that we have included from our, uh, our planning process that, uh, that we have at the agency. Uh, some, some of our strategic planning goals, we really wrapped this around four goals that look at the operations of the agency, the resources of the agency, uh, the structure of the agency, and, and our finances. So this is uh, kind of what is guiding us through the next five years, you know, to get us to that 2020 time frame uh, as an organization. Next. Uh, the purpose. Why are we here? Um, you know, we serve the public and public safety agencies. Uh, we're responsible for all the 911 and dispatch services in Sioux Falls and Minnehaha County. Um, we have a long history. For many years, we, we've been around. Prior to 1980, the service was provided by the Sioux Falls Police Department. Uh, in 1980, we were created as an entity of the county. And then up until about uh, end of 2007, the city and the county got together and created Metro as a standalone organization uh, that we are today. Um, going forward, you see we have 2015 listed in our history. Uh, we're kind of looking forward into uh, the next big thing on the horizon for us is next generation 911. Great technology advancement, uh, many years in the making. So that is um, right around the corner. We think in early 2015, we're gonna see some benefits of that project. Next. Uh, the jurisdiction we serve, fairly obvious for most of you. I believe that uh, you've, you've been around here for quite a while. We serve 22 agencies, a mix of law enforcement, uh, fire rescue, and EMS agencies uh, in the city of Sioux Falls and throughout Minnehaha County. And it's approximately 195,000 uh, people that we serve. You can see the structure of the organization, a uh, fairly flat structure. Uh, the structure changed a little bit as a result of our strategic planning, a little flatter. Prior to, you would see the, uh, some of the coordinators reporting to either the deputy director or the business manager. Uh, we flattened that structure out a little bit, so uh, those individuals report to the director. Next. So the finances. When we look at uh, how we're funded, our revenue is from the 911 surcharge. If you remember in 2012, uh, the legislature increased to $1.25 per line. Uh, that covers about 60% of our expenses at the agency. Leaves uh, quite a bit to, to fill the gap. So that gap is filled by the city and the county. The city provides 75% of the remaining and the county fills the other 25%. Our expenses, uh, as with uh, many organizations in the service sector, we don't have a lot of equipment or, or property that we maintain, so the majority of our expenses are personnel. Approximately 80% of our expenses on a regular basis are personnel expenses. 16% uh, roughly are operating expenses, and capital this year's budget is 4%. Uh, in most years, you'll see in a graph later on, we don't have a large capital program. We just simply don't have a lot of equipment that we maintain. So into the budget for 2015, our revenue. We're looking at uh, approximately 1% growth. Uh, we, we use a little bit of statistics to try to forecast this. We don't have a ton of information on the, uh, since the surcharge increased in 2012. So we try to get uh, as close as we can to the, uh, 
to the actual number last year, I think we we're within $1,000 of our budget. So we're very close, we're, we're pretty good at this. Um, when we look at the city and county contributions, the message that we've received for the last several years from the Metro Management Council has been, you know, don't exceed that 5% growth, you know, really that three to 5% is the number that we've, we've strived for for the last five years. And this year we were asking, we are asking for a 4% increase from the city and the county, which equates to about $35,000 from the city and about $12,000 from the county uh, over what we had last year. Additionally, we do have other sources of revenue with uh, the City of Brandon Police Department pays on a percentage of their total calls for service for the police service there. Uh, about 3.2% of our work comes from the City of Brandon Police Department. So that's how we figure that out. Uh, we have some, a few grants that we get, not a lot of money, but we get a couple thousand dollars for a wellness program that we do for our employees. And then we do provide services to um, local attorneys, state's attorneys, everyone else, as far as uh, 911 audio recordings, uh, radio recordings, items that, you might, that we get subpoenaed for in court. We provide that information and we do make a little bit of revenue off of that. You can see our revenue projection. Uh, you see it slowly climbing, then you see it dip, and that dip is in 2018. And that's a result of the sunset uh, provision and the uh, legislation that was passed in 2012. I think at some point, um, both the city and the county will have to come back and address that. I don't think that point is this year. Um, looking forward, I think we get through the first uh, steps of the next generation 911 project to see where that leaves us, what, uh, maybe cost or efficiencies we, we see through that and uh, go to the legislature then and see if a, a sustained increase is necessary at that time. In 2018, it goes from $1.25 to $1 per line. Our personnel expenses, uh, as I said, this is 80% of our, our total budget for the year. Uh, this year includes uh, funding for three additional uh, communications operators, and it includes our salary policy and a cost of living adjustment of 2.25%. Uh, we work hard to maintain our overtime within 6% of our overall personnel expenses. Uh, we've met that goal every year for the last uh, five years, so it's uh, a, lot of, a lot of hard work by the supervisory staff and management staff to, to do some good scheduling and make sure that we're applying the appropriate amount of resources at the right times. Uh, one thing that we always keep, our, our, uh, keep a pulse on is health insurance. Uh, our health benefits to our employees have leveled off the last few years. Um, we saw a decrease last year of approximately 9%, which unheard of for most people, but uh, we do use a planning factor of 10% for those health benefits, uh, and that's what we did include in this year's budget. And you can see this is our projection through 2019 for our personnel costs beginning in 2008 through 19. You see 2010, the, uh, the numbers dipped a little bit. That was due to a uh, reduction in FTEs uh, we closed our radio shop and reduced our uh, administrative assistant position. Next. I just wanted to, you know, the big thing with personnel budgets, especially when you ask for new personnel, I just wanted to share with you some of the reasoning for that. Um, three new communications operators will allow us to uh, look at our relief factor, you know, how much time is a person actually available to work uh, when you take into consideration sick days, vacation days, um, regular days off, training days. And when you go through all of that, you get a relief factor. Um, so we apply that relief factor to our current staffing, and that uh, gives us part of our answer. The next part we look at is our call volume. And our call volume is increasing uh, on an annual basis. And with our current call volume, just to share with you for the Sioux Falls Police Department, Almost every 25 seconds, we have interaction with a police officer in Sioux Falls. Every 63 seconds, we have interaction with a sheriff's deputy in Minnehaha County. Every 67 seconds, we have interaction with a firefighter in the city of Sioux Falls. 
uh, you know, those are the, the meat and potatoes of what we do. Law enforcement is probably 90 to high ni low 90s, high 80s percentage of what we do every day. Um, so when you look at those things and then you manage the call taking on top of that, right now we had one dedicated call taker from 7 in the morning till 3 in the afternoon. And when you use that person to also relieve for breaks, uh, two 15-minute breaks per person per shift, um, that really means that we have dedicated call taking capability for about 24 minutes out of every hour. Over that same time period, we had um, 75 minutes worth of telephone conversation. So it means that the workload gets pushed to other people that are also trying to maintain that radio communication with first responders. So we think as a means to provide uh, better service, more timely service to our uh, constituents, whether it be a police officer, sheriff's deputy, or a citizen calling 911 or a non-emergency number, this increase in staffing will allow us to do those things. Our operating budget, um, hopefully good news, that we're actually going to go down $3. Uh, a lot of this is due to, we do have some new equipment that was put in place in previous years, and when you buy new equipment, you save a little bit on maintenance um, in the near term. Uh, also, we're able to restructure some service agreements with some of our partners to more accurately reflect the costs that are attributed to Metro versus our partner agencies. And so through those efforts, we've been able to uh, keep that operations cost static or actually decrease $3. Uh, one thing that we've also done is to realign our equipment replacement program. Instead of buying 20 computers every five years or 40 computers every five years, we try to buy a little bit every year. Same with our radios. Um, by purchasing those every year, we can avoid some of those peaks and valleys, uh, make it a little bit uh, more sustainable for our future. You can see kind of the graph here of our operating budget, what it uh, started out in is 2008 and where we are today in 2014 and projected in 15. And all the way through, uh, based on what we know today, what we think it'll be in 2019. Capital system or capital program, the one thing that this budget does include is uh, money to purchase a new 911 telephone system. Approximately a million dollars for that system. Big asterisk on this though. I don't think that we're gonna have to purchase this. Uh, through the next generation 911 project that's currently uh, in contract negotiations with the state of South Dakota, it looks like that system they uh, are procuring will be able to uh, replace our current 911 system, and that will be in place likely in early 2015. So as long as that gets put in place, we will not have to buy that uh, system, which will save us a million dollars roughly over five years. Uh, that savings will... Um, you know, as, if all goes as planned, we'll use that savings in the future to offset uh, potential uh, increases to city and county general fund requests. And you can see this graph just shows our capital program. Um, the last spike you see there was when we purchased or paid off our last telephone system and purchased some uh, furniture for our agency. So next year, hopefully when I'm here, you'll see that uh, again, maybe at that 50,000 or below line is what we anticipate. Thanks. So the, the summary of our budget, uh, we're looking at a 1% increase in revenue. Uh, from the 911 surcharge, a 4% increase in the request from city and county. Um, overall, we're looking at a 10.4% uh, increase in expenses with that largely attributed to the uh, personnel expenses that we have, including the new FTE. Um, not likely that we're going to purchase a uh, new telephone system, however, uh, we are uh, including it in the plan in case something should happen that uh, would require us to do so, but we're not anticipating to have to execute that project. I guess depending on any questions, that, uh, that's all I have for you this evening. Okay, at this time, do we have any public comment? Any questions on the county side? Oh, that, that first presentation. Are there any questions on the county side? Okay. 
questions on the city side? Councillor Jameson. Darren, the uh, next generation 911 phone system, uh, I, I served on the Metro Management Council for a while, but I, if I remember right, you were saving money over the years in order to come up with that capital expense. Is that right? So you've got kind of a savings account? That's, built up. that's correct. And so going forward, if you don't spend it, um, well, I, I just wanted to maybe state as well, then if that was true, as I thought, I just, I just think you're doing a fine job and your, so is your staff preparing and uh, having been prepared for changes to come and, and looking forward to when the sunset clause uh, sets in with your surcharge. Uh, um, I, I just want to make sure the rest of the council understood that that money was being saved over the years to prepare for that this day. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I think if, as you stated, if it doesn't occur and all we have to do is, uh, we can use that money to offset the city and the county. Absolutely. I think that's just great. Thank you. Councilor Staggers. Uh, yes. Um, what is the total number of FTE that you're planning for next year? The total? Next year, we would be looking at 46. 46? Yes. FTE? Yes. And uh, also, what percentage of 911 calls are emergency? Um, you know, we don't go back after the fact to, to look at how many re we receive, but we get approximately 90,000 911 calls a year and approximately 175,000 uh, non-emergency that come in on our seven digit telephone number. Um, so not everything that comes in on a 911 line maybe would get categorized as an emergency by by someone else, but if it's happening in your life, it is an emergency. So it's hard to say what would actually be defined as an emergency, but um, we have, you know, 175,000 calls for service a year, and uh, they vary in their uh, level of response. Yeah, also um, the number of people that, well, like on a daytime shift uh, <laughs> that are operators, did I see the figure seven? Is that right? Or? Are correct. What, what this uh, increase in staffing would do would increase from seven in the morning till three in the afternoon from seven to eight. And then from three to 11, the minimum is eight people. And then from 11 to seven, it is seven people. Okay. So, so if I can just, yeah, once again, try to clarify something. Mm -hmm. um, so let's say that we have eight per shift or something. That's 24. But you said you have 46 people employed? Correct. Correct. So that's the minimum that you have to have to operate. And so in order to get to that minimum, uh, the formula that you'll see a lot of people use is uh, for a 24-hour operation is roughly 5.1 people per um, F per minimum requirement. So if our minimum requirement is eight, let's just say, then you would take it times the 5.1 to get to the 40. We've broken it down a little further to the shift because we know that for two thirds of the day we need eight and for one third of the day we need seven. And so we take that, we factor in our relief factor which accounts for regular days off uh, because people are only working five days a week. It counts uh, the average number of sick days that people have and it accounts for the vacation time that our staff accrues and takes. And it also accounts for training and other things that take them away from actually performing the duties of a 911 operator. So when we look at that relief factor, uh, an industry average is typically 1.7. Uh, Metro, last time we calculated it, when we were putting all this together, we came in at about 1.6. So we actually use um, a little bit less personnel than what maybe the industry average is. If I could just one other question here to clarify. So how many, how many employees do you have that are not operators? That's what I'm... We have six management personnel. Okay, six, thank you. And those, of those six, one is the director, one is the business manager, one is the deputy director, one is our quality assurance coordinator who is responsible for all of our quality assurance of medical calls, non-medical calls. We have a training coordinator that our training program is about six months long. And so she coordinates all that and our ongoing training. And um, we have a technology coordinator that maintains our fleet of, we have about 40 computers. Um, 
40 radios, and just all the things you would think go along with running an organization. So that those are the six management, everyone else is floor okay. staff. Okay. Thank you. You bet. Any other questions? Okay. Look for a motion on the county side. A uh, motion by Kelly to approve. Second. I have a motion and a second on the county side to approve the 911 budget. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. Motion on the city side. Move to Move. approve. Second. Kylie. Roll call, please. Council members Anderson? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. That's approved 7 nothing. Thank you. Item 4 is a joint budget hearing for Siouxland Heritage Museums. Good evening. Bill Hoskins, Director, Siouxland Heritage Museums. Um, <clears throat> I've been sitting, it takes me a minute to get going. The Siouxland Heritage Museums are dedicated to the experience of learning in our community, uh, its families, visitors, through the collection, preservation, and interpretation of history. We operate the Old Courthouse Museum and the Pettigrew Home and Museum. Both are on the National Register of Historic Places. Uh, the Pettigrew sat, celebrated its 125th anniversary this year, or birthday. Uh, the old courthouse will be 125 years old next year. Um, our visitation in 2013 was uh, 81,000. Our busiest days of the week uh, are Friday, Saturday, Thursday in that order. Um, our busiest months of the year, visitation-wise, are October, August, November, and April. Uh, visitors last year came from 47 states, well, every place but Delaware, Maine, and Rhode Island, and 23 foreign countries. Uh, the busiest states, probably no surprise, other than South Dakota, are Minnesota and Iowa, but in the top 10 are California, Wisconsin, North Dakota, Illinois, and Texas. <clears throat> we manage a uh, 95,000 catalog artifacts. They range in size from an automobile to something a little bit smaller than a dime. Uh, about 3,000 objects per year are on exhibition. You can view about 10,000 online uh, through the website. Uh, public research requests are up substantially in the last five years. Our education staff, we do a lot of programming. 737 programs last year for 41,608 people. We served 88 K-12 schools in, uh, uh, in 24 school districts, including every single school in Minnehaha County. About 68% of the offsite programs are in the city of Sioux Falls, 12% in Minnehaha County outside the city, 8% in Lincoln County, and the remaining uh, is outside that two-county area. Uh, demand for programming has increased over 309% since uh, the year 2000. Uh, some of our top on-site programs are the Con Plaza Concert Series. Friday is the last one of the season. Uh, Star Lab Kids Activity Day and the Halloween Party. Uh, <clears throat> we have uh, traditional exhibitions. Um, we have six galleries at the Old Courthouse Museum, three at the Pettigrew Home and Museum. Uh, we produce in-house about five ex exhibitions per year. Uh, that's over seven exhibitions since the year 2000 have been produced for the old courthouse or the Pettigrew. Duration, they're designed to last 18 to 24 months in, in time. Our average cost for producing those exhibits, including labor, over the last 10 years has been about $60 per square foot. That's substantially below the average commercial cost. If you hired uh, a split rot productions or something, you're paying about $250 a square foot for the same product. We do uh, rent the facility. Last year, 90 times for 7,100 people. 
uh, about 75 people per rental. The <clears throat> staff hours, we were open an additional 379 hours for those rentals. Those staff hours, the cost is reimbursed from the enterprise fund that handles the rentals back into the operations budget. We'll talk a little more about that later. About 61% of the rentals are wedding related. And the top months for rentals are, we're just getting into them, September, October, November. Um, we have to date this year had about 60 rentals and, uh, and, and the fall's looking really busy. <clears throat> uh, we do have a small budget, but really the biggest job of marketing is to get press coverage. And we had over 102 print print media stories last year about the museums. Uh, we, uh, with radio, TV, and online stories, we average about 3.2 uh, news stories per week about the museum system. Uh, we have a Facebook page uh, for both the Pettigrew and the old Courthouse Museum. Our, probably the most popular thing is we do a Friday photo challenge on uh, Facebook. You can check that out where we put out historic photos and have people guess where those are in the city or the county today. We have an extensive volunteer program. Last year we had 89 volunteers who donated 3,500 hours in support of the museum staff. Uh, the majority of those volunteers are over the age of 40 and uh, most of the volunteers are one-time or one-event volunteers. Uh, only about 44% of the volunteers are people who are repeats, who will come in at least once per month during the course of the year and volunteer for the museum. The volunteer program is supported entirely with private funds through the Siouxland Heritage Museums Alliance. The Siouxland Heritage Museums were created in 1974, 40 years ago, uh, by a joint cooperative agreement between the city of Sioux Falls and Minnehaha County. We have 11 board members, uh, five who are city appointments, five that are county appointments. Those include uh, a city council member, a member of the county commission, and the 11th member is the president of the Siouxland Heritage Museums Alliance, which is a 501c3 private nonprofit friends group for the museums. Well, anyway, Article 4 of that uh, joint cooperative agreement museum board shall prepare and recommend an annual budget to be presented to the city council and county commission. That's why we're here. The museum's budget is, uh, is I've heard one board member say convoluted. It isn't exactly straightforward. We're actually talking tonight about five and six budgets. Um, <clears throat> the operations budget, the Pettigrew maintenance, the old courthouse maintenance, a collection center maintenance budget and two revenue funds, the museum special enterprise fund and the museum store fund. If you took all those together and looked at them as a whole, the operations budget is 76% uh, of what we talk about. Uh, the maintenance budgets for the Pettigrew and Old Courthouse are 7% of what we're spending in a year. Uh, the Enterprise fund and store, those revenue budgets are about 16%, and uh, the collection center in this proposal would be 1%. Who's paying the tab on that? Well, it really comes down to the cities in this budget is 41% of the total, the county 43%, and um, <clears throat> privately raised, the revenue fund 16%. The operations budget, and as I go through these, each of these budgets seems to have a little bit different rules of, op of use and uh, of the road, you might say. The operations budget is, under the joint cooperative agreement, supported 50-50 by the city and the county. It's administered by many uh, <clears throat> It uh, really comes down to two parts, human resources, which is 92 percent and uh, our operational expenses which is eight percent in the proposed 2015 budget. Uh, the operations budget we're looking at an increase of about 1.9 percent. 
Uh, the biggest part of that's human resources. Well, we've uh, full-time equivalents over, over time have decreased, uh, and we're holding steady at 16 full-time staff to operate both sites. Uh, our human resources are our biggest cost, and full-time salaries, the biggest part of that, 75%. The second largest part is group health insurance, and it's a story you've heard before. Um, some highlights to that budget. <clears throat> well, uh, the operational expenses portion of that budget is actually decreasing 7% in uh, 2015. Um, it really goes to support our part of our marketing part of our exhibit cost, part of our collections, supplies and materials cost, office supplies, postage, and, and the telephone. The Pettigrew maintenance budget is the city of Sioux Falls, administered by Minnehaha County. And uh, in 2015, we're asking for a decrease of 17%. And uh, I'll just clarify this one. In the 2014 budget, we, uh, a, a new phone system for the Pettigrew was funded. That's about $4,000. And uh, once we buy those phones, I, I don't need to buy more this year, the next year. So uh, that's the, the decrease. It's basically a flat level budget. Major projects that we do have at the Pettigrew, there are 98 windows. And over a number of years, we are just systematically going through and replacing and uh, upgrading the storm windows. So that's an ongoing project. Uh, a lot of it is uh, daily maintenance. You have 125 building. You never know what, when you get there in the morning what's going to happen. Uh, one of the other things that's in the capital uh, city CIP request are for two new heating, air conditioning, and ventilation units on the museum edition. Uh, um, and uh, that's part of the CIP request for the museum this, in 2015. Uh, if you look at the how are, we're spending that money, maintenance money, about 30% is building repair, 42% at the Pettigrew is utilities, uh, professional services, and that's really Midwest alarms, uh, uh, sprinkler servicing, air handling unit, and such. Uh, is a, another large percent. Uh, the old courthouse museum budget, funded by the county, uh, administered by the county, uh, that budget is decreasing slightly. Some of our major projects we're looking at there are our windows, uh, steam traps for the heating system, and uh, tuck pointing. Um, <clears throat> That, like the Pettigrew, if you look at it, utilities are a very large percent, 39%. Uh, uh, about 36% of our budget is for um, building repair. And that's just ongoing maintenance of a, an old building. Uh, security, um, supplies, and uh, janitorial supplies make up the balance. <clears throat> uh, last November, we uh, came, the city council and county commission came to an agreement regarding a collection storage building for the museum. Uh, at this point in time, uh, the land is listed uh, for sale with the realtor, and there has been no progress on that uh, sale. Uh, in talking with the architect today, uh, he does not believe that at this point, uh, we would be able to begin construct if it's sold today. Uh, we'd be bidding, opening bids in December maybe, and we would not be able to begin construction until April. Since the anticipated construction cycle on that building is approximately 10 to 12 months, there really is no reason to appropriate any kind of budget in 2015 for the maintenance of that building. Um, the Museum Enterprise Fund. This is a revenue fund. It was established in 1996. It's administered by Minnehaha County, but it was set up to receive revenues and account for expenses associated with the rental space in the museum system. 
uh, from sponsorships and the provision of programs, events, and services for which a fee is charged. Uh, you get to hear about the Enterprise Fund uh, once a year in April. I come and uh, present a report about the previous year to the Council and the Commission. Um, the budget that we're asking for, which is really a spending authority in this revenue fund, is $185,824 um, for next year. <clears throat> the Enterprise Fund's income comes from a variety of areas, including the museum's endowment. We get about $40,000 a year from the endowment. That's used for specific projects within the fund. The Museum's Alliance provides us some money. Rentals provide a lot of income to the museums. Uh, sponsorships and donations, program revenue, uh, are <clears throat> and, and research by the public all go to supporting the income for that. How we spend the money really comes down to we're spending about 16% on educational programming. And this is uh, the sole place where all the cost for educational programming that we present is coming from. Exhibits, 12%. Collections, 21%. We have to pay taxes uh, on some of the programs that we do, uh, day camps and stuff. We're required to pay uh, sales tax on some of those programs. Travel and training for the staff is included in this, uh, um, the Enterprise Fund. Human resources, rentals, and ma building maintenance all have spots in the Enterprise Fund budget. Really, when it comes down to it, some of the highlights is 33% of two of the staff positions are paid for out of the Enterprise Fund. Uh, our exhibits assistant and our events coordinator, that totals to about a little over $45,000 a year in 2015. We budgeted for two college interns to help work uh, that's uh, for 12 weeks, 40 hours a week. Uh, that's been budgeted. All the labor associated with the rentals that we do, uh, we do get the income in, but the income uh, is all paid for by the Enterprise Fund. Um, anyway, 100% uh, of our educational programming supplies, um, materials, about 70% of all what we're spending on materials and 100% of the conservation costs, exhibit materials are all coming from the Enterprise Fund. The museum, uh, the store fund was set up in 1990. It's administered by the county to receive and account for revenues and expenses associated with operating a museum store. Uh, we're asking for a budget of 23.6 for that. Um, basically, the store will pays for development and uh, ac acquisition of inventory for the museum store, advertising for the museum store, credit card fees associated with sales, and in this budget, as in the last couple years, we have uh, $6,000 from the store fund that would go towards uh, educational, supporting educational programming. <clears throat> um, of all the budgets, and I talk about all of them, but really tonight we need to adopt three, the operations budget, it, which is 997245 That would be split 50-50 between the city and the county. The museum enterprise fund budget and the museum store budget are the budgets that need to be adopted in the joint budget hearing. Uh, the respective maintenance budget are up to the city council and the county commission for the maintenance of their buildings. Thanks for 40 years of support to the Siouxland Heritage Museums. If you have questions, I'd be happy to answer them. To the new council members, I would invite you at any time. I'd love to give you tours of the museum and, and talk a little bit more about our operation. Thank you. Uh, first, we'll open up uh, comments or questions from the public. Is there any questions? Any questions on the county side? Okay. Questions on the city side? 
Councilman Rolfing. Yes, I noticed um, that we are, you had a store budget uh, was down significantly from last year. Can you explain that, please? Well, um, after several, it, it's really a spending authority, but when we got into what we've been actually spending the last few years, this number is a lot closer to what our expenditure for products is. Your cost of goods is what it amounts to, huh? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Do that be look for a motion on the county side, please. Make a motion to approve uh, or second John's. I have a motion and a second on the county side. Are there any other questions or comments? All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. Looking for a motion and a second from Move the city. Move to approve city side. Second, Ralph. Roll call, please. Council members Anderson? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. And that passed 7 nothing. Mm. Let's see. Motion and second to adjourn. <clears throat> oh, we don't have any other. Do, have any, do we have any old business? Is there any old business on the county side? Any old business on the city side? Okay. Any new business on the county side? Seeing none. Yeah. Any, any, um, I'd make a motion to adjourn, madam. Second. A motion and a second to adjourn on the county side. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. Move to adjourn on the city side. Second. Voice vote. Aye. Aye. <laughs> this joint meeting is adjourned. <laughs>